I'm going to introduce you first, Mike. Uh, so everyone, we're going to be starting again now. So uh, get back to your stations. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mike Van Cleff. He's the Stewardship Director at Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space in New Jersey. And he also serves as the Invasive Species Strike Team Program Director there. Uh, he is a co-founder of the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team, which started in 2008 with the goal of bringing greater efficiency and effectiveness to invasive species management. Mike has a PhD in ecology from Rutgers University and over 25 years of experience in land stewardship, planning and research, working extensively in the evaluation and management of rare and invasive species and deer management. He has consulted with over 30 organizations in New Jersey, including the New Jersey Invasive Species Council, for which he prepared the New Jersey Strategic Management Plan for Invasive Species. Uh, welcome, Mike, and you, you can take it away. Okay, yeah, so um, uh, Linda's gonna have to advance the slides for me because my technology is not up to snuff. Um, but I'm just gonna go through, you know, some of the basics about what the strike team is, and then we'll get into the sort of nitty gritty of, of uh, what we've been seeing in New Jersey that might be uh, heading your way. Next. Okay, so, um, yeah, or generally, you know, we have similar kind of goals to you guys. You know, we want to protect natural lands through coordinated strategic invasive species management. And uh, in New Jersey, we're the only, you know, single entity that, uh, only entity that solely is dedicated to that. Next. And like I said, I'm not going to you know, go through all this in detail, but you know, we do mapping, data analysis, and reporting. We do outreach. We do training, and you know, the real sort of on the ground stuff, searching and eradicating. Next. And we have a fair amount of uh, people involved with the project. Um, all of the staff are, are part time. It's basically if we have grants and contracts. Um, and you know some other fundraising just for folks that can't be under grants or contracts, but that's fairly minimal. Um, but we have a lot of people, a lot of a lot of brains there, and a lot of talent in that group. Um, so it, you know it really helps us. Um, we have a four-person steering committee to keep us you know in tune of what's going on around the state, and we also have a technical advisory committee, which is also really really important um, with expertise in various taxa. And, um, really helps us make decisions. Uh, every year we have a, a review meeting and we go over the data that's been added since the prep past year, any news that's come up, and we, we um, uh, evaluate the species and make any changes that seem necessary to the group. And that also includes um, treatment recommendations as well as species additions and how we rank them. Next. So yeah, we've we've been around since 2008, um, and this is the, the numbers through last year. So we've searched a lot of acres. New Jersey's five million acres. So uh, by our definitions, we've searched 775,000 of them, um, detected 17,000 populations, and eradicated 3,000 of those. So obviously, the as you all know, the detections always outstrip the eradications. <laughs> Um, but we're doing our best to, um, you know, to, to stay focused on the most um, effective and efficient strategies. And one of the notes for New Jersey that, that has been true and steady over the years is about 35% of the sites have no emerging species and about 45% of sites have less than 10. So individual land managers, stewards can do um, you know, pretty effectively go after the emerging species on their properties. Um, but, you know, capacity is always an issue. Next. Uh, we have a, a nice uh, grant from the United States uh, Forest Service, and we were going to probably finish this year, but that COVID has, has nixed that. We're plugging away, but we're not going to finish this year. We have through next year to finish. 
Um, and we've been working with lots of private landowners and also public landowners and nonprofits, but a, a, the brunt of it was reaching out to private landowners and basically bringing this sort of method of uh, planning, um, you know, prioritized invasive control work uh, to private landowners. And, and, and through the grant, we basically implement year one of a 10 year plan. And we, you know, we obviously hope that they'll continue and, you know, I've met lots of good people doing lots of good work on their properties and, and we're glad that we can help them out. Um, next. And we regularly have contracts as well. Um, so, you know, New Jersey is very county based. Um, you know, certain counties are, are, are good on the stewardship and will put resources into it and others not so much. Uh, but Essex and Morris, um, Monmouth as well, uh, they're actually under the Forest Service grant, not a contract. Um, and then Jockey Hollow and the municipality of Princeton has also hired us on an annual basis to do, uh, you know, again, sort of working on emerging invasive species as the priority. Next. There you go. Um, so yeah, we, we, um, in 2019, we really stepped up the uh, outreach efforts. And this year, obviously, we were on track to probably do similar or better. Um, and, and like many other folks, we've switched to webinars. Um, and we're, so we're still getting the word out there and um, you know, hoping that people will, will do things like voluntarily not purchase uh, invasive species and things like that. Uh, we also do training sessions for uh, professionals as well. So, you know, obviously if someone's expertise is wildlife, they might not know all the new emer newly emerging plants. So we reach out to folks like that as well. Next. And we've been really excited about the, the local strike team um, concept and just trying to, um, <clears throat> you know, basically train and, and, provide information to local groups of volunteers that do lots of impressive work. Um, the Friends of Great Swamp, uh, probably the most long-standing group that, that focuses on the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the Watch Arm Reservation folks um, started up in the last couple of years. Hilltop Reservation, Foots Pond. I had another call this morning for someone in Monmouth County. So it's something we, we obviously, the strike team as we are, are not going to, you know, um, you know, make as much of a dent as we'd like. Uh, we need people on the ground doing work on, on their favorite pieces of land near their homes. And, you know, it does seem to be building uh, interest and we do whatever we can to help them out. Thanks. And just as a little background for New Jersey, I know you guys are right next door, but um, you know, this is our, our, our situation. Um, clearly, there's been lots of development, you know, since the 70s in New Jersey, um, but we do still have about 55% natural cover, <clears throat> and lots of that natural cover is still not protected uh, or developed, so we will see what the future holds, but this is certainly the context of invasive species management in New Jersey. Thanks. And then the other big element of it is deer overpopulation. So this is in Hopewell Township, which is in Mercer County, just north of Trenton. And, you know, we regularly uh, get over 100 deer per square mile when we do our nighttime counts. And, you know, that's equates to over 150 after birthing. And, you know, 10 is more in line with the literature and some other um, estimates of impacts where, you, where impacts are significantly reduced when you get down to 10. So we're, you know, 10 times, 15 times more deer than there should be. And that obviously has a huge impact on invasive species cover as we've all noticed, they tend to prefer uh, native species or put it another way, the non-native species that deer don't eat are, are ones that are pot much more likely to become invasive. Next. So yeah, these are just some more numbers for New Jersey. Um, lots of introductions, 
about a thousand established non-native plants in our flora, 2,000 native ones, about 40 widespread invasive plants, and 105 emerging or potentially invasive plants. So with that number, uh, you know, obviously fluctuates from year to year as things come into the state new or we find them, um, or they sort of pass from being emerging to widespread, uh, the number of areas, but it's always much larger than the existing number of widespread plants. So it's very troubling and why we focus on emerging invasives. Next. And then the other thing we do, and I know I've heard you guys how you, your system and how you refer to things, we have something similar. Um, so we have 143 total species, 106 plants, 37 non-plants, pets, pathogens, et cetera. Um, and we put them in stages. So a stage zero plant would have less than 10, um, less than 10 uh, population, known populations in the state. You know, and then stage one would be 11 to 100, you get the gist. Um, and then if you, I believe it's a thousand was our threshold. Once you've exceeded a thousand known populations, we just say, okay, you're widespread. And then we also keep watch species sort of off to the side, but noted um, that you could, um, you know, that, that we're not sure where to put them. We don't know if they have invasive potential, but we're leery, so we just keep them in the watch group. Again, this is sort of typical permutation of what a lot of other folks do, but this is how we've, we've done it in New Jersey. And with our technical committee, you know, we don't, um, overly tie ourselves to the number of thresholds for a particular category if if they're not recorded in, in the database but our technical experts know there there's there's many more of them or it's building we'll we'll put them in a stage class based on the expertise of our, our uh, committee members next and yeah i guess i'm not sure why i put this in there but it's, <laughs> this is the voluntary effort we have um, we call it the Landscape Planting Pledge, and every year we, um, I guess go to the next slide. So we have a list, and it's a two-page list. One side is the commonly available, and then the next slide is the not commonly available. But the idea is to make it easy for folks to um, uh, participate by not making it worse, so to speak, um, by not buying species on the list. And we've had, you know, I know people look at it and use it personally. Um, the municipality of Princeton sort of adopted as part of their uh, not um, regulatory list for their municipality, but as a recommendation. So we're hoping that catches on more and more so that we are fishing less things out of the woods because people are buying less of them. Uh, yet yeah, next. Yeah, so this is just the other side of the list, things that you're not likely to purchase, um, the more truly weedy things that aren't ornamental. Next. Okay, so I have a, um, a fairly long list of things following in these slides, and I'll start with uh, the pests and the pathogens uh, next. So, um, yeah, I know you guys have some of these things already and know more about them than I do for sure. Uh, but these are some of the things that are being worked on um, or, or monitored, you know, pests and pathogens, especially uh, Rosa U with the uh, New Jersey Forest Service is the expert for, for our, within our technical group and within the state. Um, so I don't have a ton of detail to add to some of these things. I know much more about plants than, than non-plants. Um, as I simply put them. Um, but oak wilt is something that is on the radar, has not been detected. Uh, beech leaf disease as well. Um, Cyrix wood wasp, um, Asian giant hornet, I guess everyone put that on their list or thinking about it after the news this winter. Uh, black stem borer and Asian gypsy moth. So these are things that, that among the things, they're not all the things, but they're among the things that Rosa Yu looks at um, uh, in her field work and has sort of organized programs to search for and detect these things. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, 
uh, was eradicated uh, in New Jersey. Um, feral hog. I have a question mark whether it was eradicated. I'm still trying to confirm it, but it was around for quite some time. And then it, it apparently they did, uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife did sort of step up their efforts and it's reported to have been eradicated from uh, one population that was rather large in New Jersey. Uh, big head carp, um, sort of a freak thing. You know, I'm not sure it's really, it was, it was found in a pond on a nonprofit's land and the owner had, was raising them. Uh, but unfortunately, those ponds would flood over into a, uh, the Wikichiyoku Creek, which connects to the Delaware River. Um, so the, the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, with a tiny bit of help from us, not much, um, uh, eliminated the big head carp. And associated with the big head carp in those ponds was Chinese pond mussel. Um, and they just finished the eradication work on that, I believe, last year. Um, sudden oak death. Uh, was, uh, I believe, found in nursery stock in southern New Jersey about 15 years ago. So I don't think it's something that we're necessarily going to find, but it, it did arrive in New Jersey and, and apparently was eradicated. Uh, next. All right. So um, the East Asian tick, I'm not sure if you guys have that or not yet. Um, so it's another tick species. It was found in one location in Hunterdon County in central New Jersey, but subsequently within the year or so after that, it was found all the way across the state. Um, so, you know, it's probably just about everywhere now um, because it was spreading, presumably it was spreading quietly uh, while no one really noticed it. I, I, I'm not far from an expert in uh, diseases from ticks and things like that, but the gist that I've gotten is um, that it might not be as bad at transmitting to humans as sort of like a deer tick, uh, but certainly we just really didn't need one more tick in the, <laughs> in the pool. Um, so yeah, we, we have that. It's spreading. It's much likely more widespread than we know, um, and that's been new to us, new, new to our, under, our recognition in the last couple of years or so. Um, clinging jellyfish is another one. I guess you guys don't have as much shoreline as us, but still, um, well, I guess you count Long Island. Um, that one is sort of not an ocean species. It seems to be in the sort of the bays and things like that. And it's a small little guy. Um, and that is sort of, you know, every year that we get a report of it spreading further from where we thought it was or, or adjacent areas and things like that. So that's yet another one. Obviously, cleaning jellyfish, what, not much you could do about it, um, but it is out there and it is new. Um, crazy worms or jumping worms, they, I think that was sort of, it's still underreported in New Jersey. And um, I think the hope is that we get a little bit more out there so we can get people recording it, but it seems likely that it's more widespread here already than we think. Um, there were multiple observations um, in Morris County parks, uh, so sort of the central northern part of New Jersey, and it just seems pretty darn likely that it's, it's more uh, widespread than we think it is as now. And they do new and different things than the European and Asian worms. So it's just, you know, one more insult um, to our soils, our forest soils. Uh, again, difficult to imagine how we might do control on this. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, it is spreading in New Jersey. Um, so uh, just moving down the list of horrors, um, the spotter and lanternfly. So that was found in New Jersey a couple of years ago, and <clears throat> it also has spread extremely rapidly across the state. So it came in from the west, from Pennsylvania, and um, it was found all the way on the eastern coast uh, in Union County uh, over the course of last summer. Um, I just found my first ones up in Warren County this year on my property. Um, 
and it's, you know, it, I think the populations are building to levels that the folks from Pennsylvania were reporting. There's massive quantities of them that that is building in New Jersey. But as far as their aerial spread across the map of New Jersey, it's, it's well underway, um, unlikely to be put back in the box. And I think, you know, U.S. Department of Agriculture, I know is killing lots of uh, tree of heaven uh, in the central, um, you know, western central portion of New Jersey. And, you know, I think for, for most people, that's mostly what you can do is try to get rid of that host species. Um, but it does seem disappointingly fast spread across New Jersey. Um, lily leaf beetles. I'm not, I don't have my finger on the pulse exactly for that, but it's something that I thought was just a garden pest. Uh, up until our technical committee this spring, uh, where it was reported that someone was finding them in wild populations, um, you know, doing significant damage to native and non-native lilies in natural areas. So, I mean, they're a very bright red beetle, very obvious, but if no one's directly looking and recording, it's hard to know exactly how much there is. Um, I would love to know, I think, I'm not sure if I'm correct or not, but I thought there might be more in New York than New Jersey, but I'm not sure of that, but I'd, I'd be interested to know what's being found in New York. Um, uh, butternut canker is another one that Rosa is looking at. Um, I mean, there's not very much butternut in New Jersey, so there's not much butternut canker, but um, it seems to be just about anywhere you find butternut, you do find the canker, so it, it appears to be spreading. Um, our update on emerald ash borer is it's ugly and getting uglier very quickly. Um, it was similar to spot and lanternfly, kind of came across from Pennsylvania in the sort of central part of New Jersey, but it's widespread throughout the state at this point, and it's quickly accelerating where we're getting tree deaths and, and falls and, you know, all the branches coming off and that blonding effect. Um, it's disturbingly fast. Um, you feel like, oh, maybe it's not going to be too bad here. And then, you know, the next year over the winter, the bark gets all stripped off and, you, you know, the crown goes to 50% its normal density. And I'm um, expecting to see lots more trees falling down in New Jersey over the next couple few years. Um, so yeah, and then there's, there's other things like some of these fish, the Asian swamp eel is continuing to spread, uh, red belly pacu might be a fluke or it might be, it might, we might find it in new locations. It's sort of a tropical fish that no one thought could survive in a pond in New Jersey over winter, but apparently they have in at least one location. Uh, flathead catfish, another of the group of sort of nasty new fish, uh, they're spreading very well. Uh, New Zealand mud snail was discovered in New Jersey. Um, I know it's been in other places already. Uh, I believe it was last year, the year before, and that also seems like a tough one to put back in the box. It's likely to continue spreading. Um, other things like snake fungal disease, um, it's, it's unknown exactly how severe it is, but certainly snakes are dying of it. Um, we study venomous snakes in some places and we have seen, seen death uh, from it, but it's unclear um, how, how detrimental it is. Um, is it just sort of picking off uh, wounded or sick snakes or is it really ravaging the population? Where we're doing you know, detailed studies of snakes, we're seeing you know, maybe one a case a year or something like that. Um, so we're not sure about statewide, or I'd be curious to know if anyone knows about it in New York. And similarly, the uh, pathogens on frogs, and there's a related one on salamanders, they've been known to occur in New Jersey for quite some time. Um, but the, the intensity of the infections, uh, I don't know, and I'm not sure if it's because I just, no one knows, or if I just don't know. Um, so those are, but those are things that we keep on our radar and hope that report, people report to us. Okay. Next. Okay. And winding through the, um, pest pathogens and other non-plants, um, Southern pine beetle, we've added it to our list and it's sort of, 
um, um, I, almost a change in how we looked at it that I just thought may or may not be interesting to folks. So I was sort of fairly resistant to the idea of adding it to our our list because it is native south of us and did travel here on its own power. Um, but you know, if you logic use the logic of well, the reason why it's doing that is because of global warming, global climate change, then it does become a human impact and you know might be uh, acceptable to put it on an invasive species list for New Jersey. So we did add it and it is already widespread in the Pine Barrens. Um, but I just thought that may or may not be an interesting story about how we sort of internally discuss things and, and decide what to put on list or not. Um, some other things that were disappointing, like the northern snakehead has now become widespread. We don't even consider it emerging anymore. Um, by Burnham leaf beetle, I always thought of that as more troublesome in New York, but it is very widespread now in New Jersey. But it, I, again, with my limited observations, it seems to not be as terrible as it could be. Um, when we first started seeing that in New Jersey, mm, six, seven, eight years ago, maybe 10, I don't even know anymore. You know, whole, you know, small clusters of populations of, of viburnums were wiped out. Uh, maple leaf, even black haw. Um, they were certainly on lots of planted um, viburnums, cranberry viburnum. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say, I don't see massive wipeouts in any way, shape or form. And I haven't for, I'm sure over five years, they, you get leaf holes, you see them, but they don't seem to be completely destroying populations at this point, which is mercifully good news, I guess. And hopefully that doesn't change. Um, other things that are, you know, sort of uh, white nose syndrome clearly is widespread and, and horribly impactful on our bat populations. Um, and bacterial leaf scorch, it's widespread, but still primarily in planted specimens, which presumably are weaker um, in suboptimal locations that we just wanted them to be growing in our landscape. Um, but I have heard of some spread into natural areas as well. Um, but I, I don't believe that's very widespread. Um, but it's certainly something that looks like it could get worse. Next. Okay. Um, all right, so lots of plants. Um, I, I always, at this point in the webinar, when I've been talking for a while, I realize how much I need to hear people <laughs> responding. Um, but I will try, I will try to keep going on here. Um, so, um, Amer maple is something that is um, definitely spreading. It's at selected sites right now. I, I probably should have put isolated on that one as well, but we're, we're finding it spreading from places uh, like Duke Farms and Watchung Reservation, uh, just popping up here and there. So it, it's definitely one we're concerned with. And, um, you know, Japanese maple has spread some more and it's it, it, it's um, more likely to find individual plants and seedlings around uh, as opposed to dense stands. But, you know, from time to time, you can find stands of Japanese maple in New Jersey. Um, and then the last maple on the list is uh, sycamore maple. Um, and that I, I've really only seen spreading individually. Um, you know, a plant here, a plant there, um, typically a planted landscape tree as the source, uh, not too far flung into the woods, um, but it is something that we like to keep on our radar. Uh, hardy kiwi is also sort of spreading. It's, it's probably isolated or slowly spreading, but man, when it hits, it is, it could be massive infestations going up the tallest trees that we can possibly grow in New Jersey. So it is certainly something to keep on the radar. And I know it, it is fairly popular uh, for people who like growing, you know, some interesting plant that they could eat. Um, so is, um, 
the um, you know it's definitely something we keep on our radar, but that we don't see very often at this point. Um, chocolate vine or akebia, um, it seems to be picking up speed. I, I mean, I, I've seen many places where it's likely that it was planted and spread from the planting, and that's more common than seeing a genuinely new population that started on its own. Um, but they could be, you know, extremely uh, devastating infestations. So, you know, it's definitely something that when we find it, it, it ends up being uh, high on our radar to get rid of it. Um, so, uh, mimosa is sort of an interesting one. It's sort of like a plant from my childhood that I thought was fascinating and amazing and beautiful. Um, it is definitely spreading on roadsides, especially in south and southern New Jersey. Um, but I had one of my moments mapping invasives uh, last week, the son of a gun moment, um, where I found it in the middle of an old field in, in Hopewell Township. So it does seem to be kind of spreading from plantings. Um, you know, whether it will form dense sort of monoculture like things, I don't know, but it is spreading quite a bit on roadsides. And again, sort of, a, it might be a Southern a, a climate thing because as small as New Jersey is, there's clearly differences between Cape May and Sussex County in, in temperature. Um, and it does seem to be much more prevalent in South Jersey than even Central Jersey and, and almost never seen in North Jersey at this point. Uh, European alder also seems to be from, um, you know, t uh, occasional individuals here and there, but widespread enough throughout the state that it's worth looking at. And, and, and also in really interesting and good habitats like limestone fens and things like that. So because it has the ability to go after some of these really globally rare plant communities, it's definitely worth having on the radar. And, and I have seen it much more in Northern New Jersey than anywhere else. So it's definitely something that is either present for you guys already, I don't know if it's on your list or not, but it's definitely something worth looking at. Um, porcelain berry um, spreading extremely rapidly now, it's definitely hitting its acceleration phase of, of infestations in New Jersey. Um, also seems to be one that's potentially on the list of responding to climate change. Um, whatever, 25 years ago when I started doing this kind of thing, it was, you know, there was a population in Staten Island, a population outside of Philadelphia. Um, and now it's all over New Jersey in large populations. Um, so yeah, that one's picking up a lot of steam and very quickly at this point. Similar is Japanese Aurelia. Um, you know, that one's certainly uh, on the cusp of being widespread in New Jersey, although it is sort of uh, somewhat discreet. Um, in north, north central, northeastern New Jersey is the worst. If you go to northwest New Jersey or even uh, parts of central New Jersey, you, you won't find an Aurelia for miles and miles and miles and miles. Um, so in those places where there isn't much, we prioritize it, but somewhere say in Essex County, it's, you know, it's already extremely widespread. So it's patchy in New Jersey, but very bad in, in large areas. Um, uh, butterfly bush is uh, also one to consider looking at. Um, it's still isolated, but you can find whole riversides along the Delaware and Phillipsburg covered with it, or old fields um, uh, covered with it here and there and then isolated individuals. Um, they do seem to get around through compost, uh, municipal compost facilities. Um, so, you know, obviously people throw them into their compost, they get composted, but usually uh, things along the edge of compost piles tend to survive and then they redistribute the compost to people spreading the plants. Um, Japanese hops has done a very good job of moving with compost. Um, so that's our status for butterfly bush. It's, it's spreading, but there's generally isolated patches of it. Um, the aquatics, I don't really know much. Um, Chris Doyle from Solitude Lake Management is on our technical committee and he kind of feeds us this news, but uh, Carolina fanwort is, is spreading in New Jersey, along with some others further down the list. Um, hardy orange, 
it's sort of been, um, let's see if I can, okay. uh, Hardy Orange is sort of isolated individuals in particular locations. Um, and definitely something we've started to treat at some of our high priority sites. So, you know, it's isolated individuals spreading from seed. You know, they have pretty large fruit, but they get, I assume they're getting carried around by things like squirrels and things like that. Um, and they are certainly spreading um, in central, the central part of the state. I can't say I've seen them anywhere else, um, but certainly, uh, I would say over the last five years or so, increasing numbers, still small numbers, but increasing numbers of uh, spottings. Uh, very similar for Cruza dogwood. Um, it's sort of uh, particular locations and you could find two dozen of them scattered throughout the woods. Um, so it's something that, you know, obviously we're, we're very conservative when we make our list. So, you know, we add it to our list because we do see spreading. Um, and I would say both Hardy Orange and Cusa Dogwood are about in the same class. They, they're definitely showing their potential and they are starting to get out in particular sites in, in New Jersey. Um, so other, other species, you know, these are, they've always been on the edge of, of my radar. Um, you know, species like Dutzia, um, we are certainly finding that also spreading from particular locations and popping up here and there over larger areas. So, you know, will it form dense monocultures? We're not sure, but it certainly does seem to be on the move. Um, and certainly if you had a high conservation out value area, you would remove it as quickly as possible because it's unclear what it will do but it's certainly capable of reproducing and getting out there on its own. Uh, next. Uh, similar to the new, new group of species that, that I keep, oh, I think I put you see it twice. Yeah, Fuzzy Pride of Rochester is the other, is the other com a common name for it. Um, but yes, yeah, found Morris County, Union County, uh, Mercer County, so sort of the central north part of the state it has been detected. Um, the, the other Aurelia, five leaf Aurelia, um, definitely seems to be spreading slowly and in an isolated way. It seems to be further down. If it's going to exponentially grow, it seems further down its curve than some others. Um, it seems to be in a spot for some time and if it's not treated, it doesn't seem to spread very rapidly. Um, but it just feels when it does occur, it can have, it could be dense monoculture. So it, it certainly smells like trouble. Um, and it is for once you know, it's fairly easy to recognize. Uh, winter creeper is absolutely spreading uh, and it's about to explode in New Jersey. You find it's very common in the landscape and you find isolated seedlings um, just about everywhere I go, I find it. You know, it might not be big populations yet, but then there, then you will find large populations in central and uh, northern central uh, New Jersey. Uh, so it's getting out there. It has the means. It's been planted a lot. Seedlings pop up everywhere, and it's only a matter of time before we start seeing more and more large populations as those initial um, uh, spreading of initial populations grow and grow and grow and get all the way up trees, which it does. It, it can coat every single tree in the forest that it infests. Um, so that's definitely a, one of the ones that we're always very quick to get rid of when we see it. Um, Sickleweed, um, not necessarily something I would have thought might be a problem in New Jersey. Apparently it's more in the, in the Midwest or further out. But we had a report of one population um, in Warren County and the unlucky, unlucky plants happened to be only about 15 minutes from my house. So um, I've been treating, I treated them the main population of it and got rid of 95 plus percent. And every year I go back and pick off any ones that I might've missed, but it, it formed a dense monoculture. So, it, you know, again, it smelled like an invasive 
Um, and we're hoping there aren't more of them out there, but it's certainly possible. Um, English IEB is absolutely spreading south to north in New Jersey. <clears throat> Again, showing up as seedlings um, just about anywhere uh, in the state. You can find seedlings in the middle of the woods and, you know, sort of like the winter creeper, if not worse, uh, it can get up trees and, and sort of strangle them and bring them down and all that stuff. And, and that, uh, you know, it, it has that, uh, again, the winter creeper English ivy have a similar feeling to them, but English ivy had, a, as time went on and we recorded populations, it was very clear that it was moving south to north. And uh, so if it isn't a problem in New York, it's likely to be uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. Um, Giant hogweed, I know you guys do a lot on that. And we don't, New Jersey's always had uh, individual populations that are found and New Jersey Department of Agriculture has always been great about as soon as they get the report going out and getting rid of it. So we don't have very much of it and we, it's, we could jump on it when it does come up. So hopefully that won't become a big problem for us um, as long as the effort is maintained. Um, Dane's Rock is sort of an interesting one. Um, it's been widespread, meaning you can find it throughout the state, but it never struck me as being terribly invasive, but it does seem to be changing. It does seem to be, yeah, there's just as many places with it as before, but now when you find it, there seems to be more than there used to be. So I'm not sure exactly what to make of it, but it's certainly making me nervous to start pulling it out of my own uh, woods at my own, on my own property. Uh, it just seems to be intensifying over time. And I think the last I heard, it was much more aggressive, say in places like uh, Wisconsin or Minnesota. I'm not 100% sure if my memory is serving me correctly, but uh, it does seem to be that it's more considered more invasive uh, west of us. Um, Hydrilla is, is spreading, but there's been really good control work uh, in the Delaware uh, Raritan Canal um, with uh, Solitude Lake Management and New Jersey Water Supply Authority. So, uh, you know, there's definitely effort in it. And then now the, they've moved to uh, Manasquan Reservoir, where apparently there's also a large uh, population of it in Monmouth County. Uh, so hydrilla is around, it's being found. There is, has been effort to directly control it, which is, is good news. Um, keep going down the list, Mike. Uh, Standish is honeysuckle. So this is one that I think because, you know, we often say bush honeysuckle. Um, it was probably here longer than we thought once we realized we had something different. Um, we started to find more and more of it. It's still not as common as sort of Amer honeysuckle or Tartarian honeysuckle in New Jersey, but it is certainly not uh, as uncommon as we thought before we realized it was different than the other ones. Um, and one of the oddball things about it is that it keeps its leaves, it could keep its leaves into January and you know, they might look yellowed and stuff, but, and most of them might be gone, but it, it seems to hold its leaves longer. So will it be worse or, or, or than other uh, shrub honeysuckles? I don't know, but it's something that recently became, uh, what we, bleh, was recently put on our radar. Uh, Siebel's crab apple is the crab apple from hell. Um, it has unbelievable potentials. Um, so think autumn olive or multiflora rose in a field, completely can take it over. Seabull's crab apple can do that. Um, seedlings in a mature forest uh, that could hang out and be there for who knows how long, withstanding the shade and waiting for some sun to show up uh, by the thousands in, in forests that have you know, a relatively complete or complete canopy. So yeah, it has it all. It could, it could take over fields and it could also hang out in the woods indefinitely waiting for light to hit it. Uh, so yeah, I, I've never seen a crab apple quite like this one, and uh, it is throughout the state, primarily in central New Jersey right now in the Piedmont. Um, but I've seen it 
pretty much in every county in New Jersey. So it's definitely uh, something to worry about. It used to be called Turingo crab apple. So it's, I, I don't know when the names changed, but that's the, another a name for it is uh, Turingo crab apple. Uh, Chinese silvergrass. Um, yeah, that's certainly one that is popping up and it's so obvious, you know, if you, if it doesn't matter how big the field is, if you're driving along the road, you're going to see a Chinese silver grass sticking out of it if it's there and it's mature. And we're certainly finding that throughout the state. Again, a little bit more on the Piedmont. You know, the Piedmont has the brunt of the human population um, and apparently geological susceptibility to invasives. Um, but you certainly see a lot of it in, in central New Jersey popping up. Um, and it's definitely something that uh, that we treat as soon as we find it. Um, back to the aquatics, parrot feather also spreading. I'm not sure if that's isolated or not, um, but it's also it, it's certainly present in New Jersey. Um, Boston ivy might be another one that is reacting to climate change. Um, it, it's certainly uh, been planted uh, along our interstates 287 things like that planted uh, route 80 planted uh, abundantly and absolutely finding seedlings in the forest um, not quite like winter creeper or english ivy yet but it just feels like a yet thing not an if thing um, it's certainly reproducing and spreading on its own uh, far flung from where it was planted Okay, next. All right, so other things, um, Amor cork tree, it definitely seems to be uh, spreading. Um, uh, from um, uh, who knows where, I don't see it planted very often, but there, are, I guess there are some planted specimens. I just found one randomly yesterday in Hopewell. Uh, fairly far from any habitations or landscapes, um, hundreds of yards at least. Um, and I have found certainly dense stands of it um, in some of the Middlesex County parks. So it has, it's spreading, it's out there in, in multiple locations and it has examples where it's, it's forming, you know, denser stands. Um, Oriental Photinia, I'm not sure if that was on the list you guys were talking about before or not, but it's becoming very widespread in New Jersey and it is exceptionally damaging. Uh, it grows clonally 15, 20 feet tall in shade, spreads by seeds as well. Um, it is definitely one of the worst newer invasive species in New Jersey by a good amount. Uh, it's, it's really a damaging species. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it, 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 I think we found out about it a little too late because um, it, it's certainly becoming widespread. Um, we've been finding more and more observations of weeping Higgin cherry. Um, again, flung around the entire state and um, starting to show up in, in numbers that feel like infestation levels. So at Ballpay Mountain in Hopewell and Mercer County, thousands and thousands of seedlings throughout the forest. So, you know, it's, there's spots like that and there's other spots where we might find tens of seedlings in a particular area. So um, it feels like it's accelerating. <clears throat> uh, so definitely one to consider. And it's also um, interesting that the majority of plants arising from seed from the ornamental weeping form are not weeping. So you're not going to necessarily see that, you know, horticultural look, um, but it is the same species. Um, kudzu, mo still mostly spreading from places where it was planted initially for erosion control or on dams and things like that. Um, but it is happily producing flowers and fruit. So uh, we expect to see more and more of it. We're at about a few dozen populations in New Jersey right now. Um, 
and yeah, we, we obviously would hope to be able to eradicate it, but it just hasn't been forthcoming as far as being successful at uh, uh, obtaining funds to do to do a, a populate rekill three dozen populations scattered throughout New Jersey. Um, calorie pair um, certainly is just about worth considering widespread in New Jersey. Certainly more on the Piedmont where there's more of everything bad and invasive wise, but uh, rapidly spreading. Uh, European buckthorn also spreading in a really strange kind of way. There's spots where it's very bad and then there's spots where I've looked at them for a decade and there's still only two or three of them that you might find at any one given time. So it's certainly highly threatening. Um, and I believe you guys have a lot of it, um, certainly in the Midwest. Um, and it seems to sort of be working its way towards that status in New Jersey. Uh, jet beat is one that I thought was, was sort of stuck um, on its growth curve for quite a while. I mean, the first populations I saw of that were you know, over 20 years ago. Um, and it's only in the last, you know, five or so years that it seems to be spreading very rapidly. So it just, you know, it's hitting that part of its growth curve and you can find very large infestations, five acre areas completely infested with it. Um, still more often than not, you'll find, you know, 200 square feet of it. Um, so yeah, it is definitely becoming worse and worse. Uh, there's been reports uh, in the northeastern part of the state of Putley Blackberry, uh, still relatively isolated, um, but it's something um, uh, that we're keeping, we're going to keep a little bit closer eye on because the, we, it does seem to be hitting its acceleration point. Uh, Japanese spirea, I'm not quite sure what to make of it, but we've found three populations of it within the last couple of years um, and it can be growing densely. I think a lot of what's getting um, uh, sold and planted right now is sort of cultivars that are shorter. Uh, these are definitely something um, uh, that we find when we find these wild populations escape they don't seem to look at all like what is being cultivated and sold now. They're much taller, wild type looking plants. Um, and we're hoping to keep ahead of this one. Um, we've, we've done work on two of the three known populations of Spirea. So, and we hope that the other one is being, being handled uh, by, the, by the landowner, nonprofit landowner. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what to expect on that one, but it is troubling that we found several populations, two of them being fairly large within the last few years. Uh, Japanese snowbell is another kind of, I always called the oddball guys that I just sort of run the periphery of my memory and I couldn't remember which ones were which. Um, but again, we're seeing more of that spreading in isolated places. Um, and then the sapphire berry that uh, Linda had told us about at some point, not so long ago, uh, we are finding that as well. And that has been put on our radar for us by Linda. So we actually have been finding that unfortunately um, from central through Northern New Jersey. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely something that's still seems fairly isolated and, uh, but it does form populations that are you know, certainly relatively dense population. Um, where am I? T. viburnum. So sort of this was one in a abundance of caution uh, we put on our list because there's so many other viburnums. Um, the, uh, but we just started to see, get some reports of that from Essex County. And I, if I skipped over Japanese snowball, because it sounds like Japanese snow bell above. Um, I didn't mean to, because that one is definitely popping up randomly and again throughout the state. Uh, and it gets, seems out of the blue. You know, it's like, where, where did this come from? We didn't notice it a year or two ago, and now we're finding it in multiple locations. Still small populations, but multiple locations. Um, so we don't know if T. viburnum is going to pick up 
uh, become more like Japanese snowball or not, um, but we are starting to see it, and it, it is a very popular landscape plant. Uh, Seabulls viburnum, I put in the same class as Oriental photinia, bad, bad news. Uh, tall, shade tolerant, spreads clonally and by seeds. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's probably going to become, it's going to become a widespread species in New Jersey and it's really just a matter of protecting particular high value areas, but you know, for land managers, if you start to see a couple of seagulls by Burnham, that is the time to get rid of them. Um, it really is part of that, in my view, a, a new class of really bad forest shrubs that are large, very large, as large as our natives could be, um, like spice bush. Um, shade tolerant, spreads clonally, spreads by, by seeds. Um, black swallow wart. Um, I think you guys have had that before us, and it's still relatively isolated populations throughout the state, but yeah, it's very invasive where it does happen. Um, and I'm not sure, but they were working, as of last year, they were, I believe they were doing trials on spreading the biocontrol agent, uh, one of the larger populations in New Jersey. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what happens with that, but it, uh, if you guys have not been treating it for longer than me, you know more than me, but my goodness, it is a tough plant to kill. It is a tough, tough bugger. Uh, next. I think that was that. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Uh, oh, that's it. That's the last okay. one. Yeah. <laughs> Where's my mute? Okay, am I unmuted? <laughs> I can hear you. I'm having trouble clicking with the mouse and I double click and it does weird stuff. Um, so sorry about not uh, inv advancing smoothly every time. Um, no, it worked, it worked. I think we have uh, a lot of things people might be interested in discussing and uh, you mentioned some questions a, a, a few times. Um, so guys, I'd like to just, uh, you know, we're done with the presentation and we're actually sort of done with the meeting, but I'd like to open up the floor to discussion and questions. Uh, if you guys would like to unmute and ask, uh, that's fine. If you don't feel comfortable, you can type it in the, in the uh, chat box. This is Joyce, I'm curious. Do our prisms also have focuses on things like eels and frogs and fish and snakes? Is it just ours that might not as much or? Yeah, we're supposed to cover all taxa, but okay. we've been sort of slow, I mean, slowly getting experts in place to evaluate different categories of uh, <laughs> added in animal, some uh, wetland animals recently, I mean, sort of aquatic animals recently. It's just a matter of not having enough people to know uh, to, in order to be able to figure out where to put it in our tiers. DE, this is Bud. Uh, DEC also does a lot of the work with the animals side of, of invasive species. Um, so that's where, you know, they're dealing with wild hogs and those type of things. So a lot of times the, the smaller groups don't deal with those as much just permit wise too, it's more difficult. Okay, um, I'm scrolling back through the chat. I had a question about golden rain tree. Did, Mike, have you seen golden rain tree in New Jersey? Yeah, from time to time, isolated individuals. Um, it's definitely something I've been thinking about. Um, and, and it's just a matter of if I see more, I'll get more nervous, but I see enough to certainly have it on our list. <laughs> okay. Um, but it, I, I think it's being, it's not, it's underreported just from our database point of view, but I see it from time to time. Okay. Typically roadside. Yeah, I, we've seen a lot in like uh, Delaware and uh, Maryland along the roadside. It's oh like yeah. If it had made it to New Jersey yet. Um, Sparingly so far. Okay, so uh, we had a, a few comments going back and forth about uh, Japanese angelica tree in Connecticut, and 
then we also had a comment about winter creeper being bad news in the, in the Lower Hudson Prism in Western Connecticut. Mm -hmm. We have had a lot of uh, reports of that. Um, European buckthorn seems to be calcifilic uh, comment. Um, we had a question about if we have cutleaf blackberry in our region and answering uh, yes, uh, Iona Island, which is part of Bear Mountain Park, and also in the New York City area. Um, and then someone else said uh, there's also in Pinecroft Preserve in Wackenbuck, New York. Uh, is that, uh, John Ziegler, is that uh, Westchester County then? Um, and uh, someone also said Hudson Highlands. So I, I love, you know, how we have these discussions and people say, oh, yeah, there's some here and there's some here. We need to get those reports in IMAP so that we know about them. So please, guys, if you know about uh, locations of these things, uh, make sure that they get into IMAP so that we can you know, make plans to uh, treat them or control them and we have a better view of what's happening. Um, Chris, a question for Mike. Sure. Uh, Mike, do you know if the hydrilla in Overpeck Creek in the Meadowlands has been confirmed? I do not know. It, it was uh, hysterically reported in the local newspapers last September, and I've been unable to find out if a botanist has actually looked at it. I don't know. I could ask and see if I can find someone who knows. Yeah, I'd lo love to know if uh, if you can find out. I also Overlook wanted to Park, comment that, I'm sorry? Overlook Park, is that what you said? Uh, Over Peck Creek oh, in, Peck in the Meadowlands Park. in Bergen County. Um, also, cutleaf blackberry is pretty widespread in the Meadowlands. Uh, I'm not even sure I've recorded every location where I've seen it. That's where I was hearing that that part of the state is where I was hearing that it was becoming much more common outside of that area. I haven't seen it very much, but that's, you know, what you were saying is what I've heard from mm -hmm. someone else as well, another botanist. Um, you know, and obviously it, it can be pretty gnarly and in infestation wise. Um, hoping we don't see more of it, but I don't have that much hope. <laughs> seems like it's just a matter of time before it gets more widespread. Um, Chris had a comment about the viburnum placatum. Uh, there, there's two varieties. There's uh, var placatum, which is Japanese snowball, and then there's var tomentosum, which is double file. Um, do you know uh, what you guys are seeing in New Jersey? Um, I feel like double file is the right answer. Okay. Um, one of our staff is a botanist and, and I know she's been the one that, that kind of drilled down on it. And I believe double file is what she had been calling it. Okay. Um, we have seen a couple of reports or we have seen encountered a couple of these uh, like individual species or, or small numbers. Um, okay. Uh, Seabolds, uh, comment about seabolds reaching massive proportions. We do have quite a bit of seabolds. That was the one I uh, mentioned in the announcements to make sure people uh, report. And if you see that it's reported in seabolds, or if it's reported in IMAP, if you can go out and check and see if it's still there and see what the abundance is, that would be great. Um, then uh, Chris says, uh, speaking up for the Lower Hudson Prism Species Categorization Working Group, information from the New Jersey Strike Force and occasional input from you directly uh, have been very helpful to us. Uh, so I guess that's a, a thank you um, that we've, we have discussed species that were on your list uh, and brought it to people's attention in the Lower Hudson. Uh, so, you know, it's been working both ways now. I think we've been bringing things to your attention, but you've been bringing things to our attention. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, it's to very much appreciate it. it, it yeah, we, we've definitely, it's good that the information flows across the border, so to speak. Yeah. Um, Meredith Taylor from uh, New York City DEP is asking, have you seen many Japanese tree lilac escapes? I only where it was sort of obviously had been planted 
and then overrun, you know, like an area that where it was part of the landscape and then it got overrun. I, I haven't really seen it otherwise, personally. Um, I mean, if you guys are seeing a lot of it, we should be considering it as um, listing it in New Jersey, but I haven't seen much of it in New Jersey. Uh, okay, the, everybody that's still on, have you seen Japanese tree lilac, lilac in, uh, in our region? No. Um, Mike, I'd be yeah. uh, this, this is Bud. We have one in the Gorge parking lot. Okay, so maybe likely planted, but is spreading, or is it something that spread there you, that you're pretty sure was never planted? I don't think it was planted there. I think it probably being its location came off of a vehicle or something like that, or okay. some, some, you know, it's right next to the edge of the parking lot and it has been there for 20 years, so. Okay. Uh, Meredith says there's a big population of Japanese tri tree lilac in Otsego County um, mm -hmm. along a creek. So that's outside of our region. Um, oh. Um, anything else? I'm going to go back another page, uh, see if it spurs any other questions. Uh, someone also mentioned a population of tree lilac in Columbia County, uh, capital Mohawk region. Um, Are we looking for Cornus Cusa? When I visit uh, Kristen down in Rockland, down the Palisades, it's amazing how much is along there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, it is something that should be uh, should be reported. I don't know that any of us on the species categorization group. Uh, I don't. I don't remember if we classify that. It might be a tier five, which would be sort of watch. Um, but I recently, uh, just in the last week, was sent a photograph of a parent tree with thousands of seedlings underneath of it. Um, and someone said, you better watch out for this one. <laughs> Swell. Yeah. Um, the, anything else? Um, Chris said, uh, do you want to share your knowledge of the Siebold's cra crab apple extent uh, with Mike? You would need unmute. If he's still on. Um, we also had a question. Do you do any of the partners or does the PRISM website have the best management advice for Aurelia Elada? Um, yeah, uh, I think we can help you with that one. Uh, check the PRISM website first because we have been putting a lot of information on there. Um, but I can definitely help you with that, Danny. Um, and Mike, uh, you guys, actually Mike, you guys have been treating Japanese angelica tree for a little bit longer than us. And I had heard one of your recent conferences that someone reported uh, doing cut stump in the winter had been effective. Do you, do you know about that? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm hearing too. Um, the folks at Great Swamp uh, tried cut stump, winter cut stump on a bunch of things. And we've, we've changed <clears throat> our, um, uh, recommendations to, to follow that advice. Um, I've personally did it on a bunch of things around my own property this winter and it especially the earlier in the winter you hit it the better. Um, if you if you're like you know towards early spring and you do it it might not be as effective on hard to kill things but I think the earlier you do it the better. It just has this slow burn effect um, where it might have shaken off glyphosate uh, in the summer as a cut stump, there's like a slow burn and it just kind of slowly kills the plant over winter. Um, so it's a really interesting find from the, 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 the strike team at uh, Great Swamp. Uh, it seems to be, seems to work on a number of things you might not think of doing cut stump to during the growing season. And with glyphosate. Yeah, yeah. So that's, the homeowners can do that because they can buy Roundup off the shelf. So yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah, just 50 50. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, I'd asked Chris to talk about the, um, the crab apple, but he doesn't have a mic, so he's typing. Uh, he said, uh, okay, yeah. Um, 
He also, I guess he's cautioning us that uh, parts of New Jersey are within range of the native Aurelia, uh, Aurelia spinosa. All right, Mike, have you found uh, the native anywhere in New Jersey? Not as yet in New Jersey. I mean, I, I've seen it certainly in southeastern Pennsylvania, not right on the border, but not right. you know 100 miles away either. But I've never seen Spinoza in, in New Jersey. Okay. Um, all right. Any of anybody else have any questions? Um, I'm, I'm going back through the slides in case that you see any of the uh, names of species spark questions that you were thinking about. Um, and Mike, we'd be happy to answer your questions about, you know, what we're dealing with uh, or, you know, how bad things are uh, with these different species in the lower Hudson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very interesting to hear what you're saying about butterfly bush because we are still getting pushback on that. Uh, nice to uh, hear that you are having getting gathering records and evidence of it um, being invasive. Yeah, it's not it's not at a, near its exponential phase, but it's you know enough of them and several large ones. So it just sort of catches your attention and shows that potential. Yeah. Uh, we also have a few groups that have been trying to manage um, Amur cork tree for a while, um, New York Botanical mm -hmm. Garden and also Vassar College. Um, and they uh, are having a lot of difficulty getting control over it. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's something to jump on uh, when they're young and uh, small. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I've gone, we haven't done much control work on it yet. We. The one I found the other day, will it's small enough and smooth enough, we'll just basil bark it and I'm sure that'll do the trick. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't gone after like big trees or anything like that to, to know what the recipe is for that. I'm a big fan of the, uh, well, it wouldn't work on this one either, but easy jack is a really good thing for younger, smoother bark things too. Is that a stem injection? Yeah, it's, um, it, it, uh, they have two different, bullets, um, but one is a, has a maze appear in it. Absolutely fantastic for knocking out large clonal populations of Atlantis. You just treat all the bigger ones and all the other ones go with it. So okay. it's, it's a nice effect. I think the core, some of the younger cork trees stands, I think, are likely like that as well. So that's why Easy Jack jumped into my brain for that as well. Okay, cool. Um, all right, anybody else? Any other questions? Well, we have a mic on the line. Um, yeah, uh, Chris said, Cornus Cusa, we do indeed have in tier five. Um, so he says, thanks for mentioning it. <laughs> um, all right, Mike, I. Um, I will invite you uh, over the winter, I will invite you to attend uh, one of our uh, working group meetings for ca species categorization. Uh, and, you know, if you like, uh, find out what we're seeing, we can find out what you're seeing, so. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Yeah, I know you guys, you guys have a much more formalized process than us. So I, I kind of like to see what New Jersey should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's really just a gathering of experts, expert opinion, and reference to known records. Uh, so. Gotcha. All right, everybody, thank you very much for attending. Um, we have recorded the presentations, and as soon as we can get those prepared and up for you, I'll send the links out. And thank you very much, Mike and Eric, for being our presenters uh, today. Um, well, thanks for having me. Really, really excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.